My name is Laura Riley. I'm the uh, Managing Director of Chicago Wilderness Alliance, and we are here today for uh, the Chicago Wilderness Cafe, introducing the Illinois Coastal Stopover Tools, um, and we're pleased to welcome Stephanie Bielke, Daniel Suarez, Jenny Fuller, and Nicole Minato from uh, Audubon Great Lakes. This is in webinar format, so you'll be muted. You can answer, um, put your questions into the chat, and we'll be happy to address those as they um, as they come along. There will be a, a portion at the end for a uh, question and answer, and you'll be able to raise your hand at that time. And if if you want to become unmuted, we can we can address that at the end. Should I go ahead, Laura? Yeah, thank you. All right. Okay. Well, welcome. Thank you all for coming. I'm excited uh, to introduce you to Audubon Great Lakes, Illinois Coastal Stopover Tool. And thank you, Laura Riley and the Chicago Wilderness Alliance for hosting this cafe. So today's agenda, we will be going over a background um, that led to the development of the tool and then um, reviewing a demonstration of features within the tool. And we'll cap that off with discussing priority sites and management recommendations that we de developed um, as part of the tool. And then um, we'll cap, uh, we'll finish with a Q&A. So we'll have at least, you know, a short time, 15 minutes at the end where we can answer questions. Introducing myself, my name is Stephanie Bilkey. I'm the Senior Manager of Conservation Science with Audubon Great Lakes, and I'm co-presenting with my colleagues here today, Daniel Suarez, Senior Manager of Conservation with Audubon Great Lakes, and Jenny Fuller, Audubon Great Lakes Project Coordinator. So why are we focusing on migratory birds as a focus of this tool that we developed? Many of you probably already are aware that migratory birds are swiftly dec declining across North America, and the statistic we often hear is about 3 billion birds lost over, over 60 years. And the majority of those birds that have been declining are migratory, and many of them breed over winter or migrate through our region here in the Chicago region. The migratory period is an especially vulnerable period in the life cycle of birds because they encounter so many different parts of the hemisphere and exceedingly run the risk of encountering areas where habitat has been lost, replaced by development, or degraded. Not only are they at risk of not finding the right habitat that they need, but they also face numerous threats during this period, and many birds simply don't survive their migration. Therefore, therefore, ensuring that migratory stopover habitat is protected and conserved is of high priority. Another reason why we're focusing on migration at Audubon Great Lakes is because a few years ago, Audubon launched their national, um, through their national science team, the Bird Migration Explorer, which is an interactive tool that shows where birds migrate across the Western Hemisphere and shows how birds connect us across the globe. And we saw this as a perfect opportunity and inspiration to launch a tool that enhances how we focus on helping birds here at home. And I believe someone will drop a link in the chat if you wanna check out the uh, Bird Migration Explorer tool. But back here in the Great Lakes in the Chicago region, we know that the Great Lakes coastline is incredibly important for migratory birds because they use it as a, a stopover and the lakes prevent um, or are an obstacle to birds moving through. So they need to be able to find places to rest and refuel along those coastlines. We also know the Chicago area in particular is of, of among the most dangerous stopover regions in North America. And I, I don't know many people that missed the news that came out last fall where over a thousand birds collided with a single building in Chicago in just one night. And that was particularly devastating. So you really see the risks that birds face 
and why it's critical to conserve habitat that birds can use um, since they're um, passing through a region. A lot of these birds migrate at night and that's why, you know, they uh, actually are affected a lot by light pollution and are drawn to areas along um, the Chicago area coast. And although, you know, there are a lot of efforts working particularly on the threat of buildings, um, we also know that, you know, these birds are coming and we have to do what we can to be able to provide habitat that they can use because not only do we have to think about mitigating threats, we have to enhance habitat so that birds can find food and um, nourish themselves during this um, dangerous migration. We saw the need for a new tool because it came from um, a desire to create or prioritize habitat conversation, conservation at a scale that makes sense to managers and also use that opportunity to connect them directly to resources. There are previous tools that have existed in the, in the past um, that have prioritized uh, where conservation can happen to help birds, but we wanted to use this opportunity to connect to land managers in um, to uh, you know the actual sites that birds are using and what kind of management actions can happen on the ground to help birds. And we also saw this as an opportunity to prepare um, for when funding comes in to uh, actually uh, help fund the, the actions that were, are taking place to help habitat for birds. Our goals for the tool that we developed were to identify key regions in the Illinois coastal region to manage habitat for migratory birds, provide stopover habitat management recommendations, and generally promote awareness of what stopover is and what birds need during this critical period. So the purpose of the Illinois Coastal Stopover Tool is to let birds inform how and where restoration happens across our region and share resources on best management practices. And this uh, slide is also showing how we gather data, um, both from uh, bird data that's available through eBird, as well as habitat and community data that was provided by land managers to inform what we're calling a quality score, um, how, how um, high quality is an area for bird um, stopover, and what kind of opportunities or an opportunity score, which would tell us um, where can we invest resources to provide high quality um, stopover habitat. And this went into a ranking system, which we'll talk a little bit about more later. And I just wanna introduce you to the geography of where we're working. This is the Illinois Coastal Zone, which is determined by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and um, who is the funder of this tool along with um, NOAA. And this is based on Lake Michigan watershed. So it's a pretty narrow um, area that follows the Lake Michigan shoreline as well as uh, parts of the Chicago River and the Calumet River. Um, but uh, we also already know that this area right along the coast is of super importance for birds because when they fly over the lake when it, they and look to make landfall, they will reach for the, the nearest land that they can find to forage and replenish their energy as they're making this long distance migration. So I'm gonna pass it over to Jenny, who's gonna go into more detail about what the tool looks like itself. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, so next, we're going to introduce the tool itself and the contents you'll be able to find as you explore. So if we head on to the next slide, um, this is just to get us oriented. So this is a general outline of the main highlights in the tool we'll be talking about today. So the tool includes several maps and resources, um, including a literature review, restoration success stories, um, quality, opportunity, and threats maps, which I'll describe more, of course. Um, priority sites and bird species pages, and um, also management recommendations on multiple scales. And on to the next slide. 
Um, before we get into the details, I do really want to first acknowledge those that made this tool possible, starting with our many project partners. And then on to the next slide, um, I want to also acknowledge our amazing advisory team that were really instrumental in building the best resource we possibly could. Um, this tool really would not be the same without their wealth of experience and expertise. And then on the next slide, we'll get a, pre a quick preview of what the tool looks like. So um, you'll see there's main tabs at the top, including a home page, maps, um, priority sites, priority species, um, also management tab with recommendations. And then there is also data sources and a literature review link. And this is a pretty quick look. So we're gonna dive into each of these tabs more in depth. Um, so moving on to the next slide, we'll start with the home page. Um, and on the next slide, you'll see the info that you'll find there. Um, so the home page starts off with an introduction to the tool, then cards for all the main pages. So things like maps, priority species, priority locations and management along with links. And then we also include restoration success stories with info like partners, management timeline, activities and links, so lots of different things. And then of course, acknowledgements to our advisory committee and project partners that made this all possible. And if we go to the next slide, um, we have a link to the literature review. I wanna mention the lit review early on because it really served as a backbone for the content of this tool. As a note, we're hoping to have this link live in April once we have the document ready for the public. And on the next slide, I'll mention briefly the content that you'll find. Um, so the lit review looked at threats primarily to migratory land birds, the importance of Great Lakes for stopover, management findings, and methods for prioritizing stopover habitat. And again, this was a really important step in informing how we created our maps and put together all our resources for land managers to use in the future. So moving on to the next slide, we're gonna dive into the map section, how we created them and how to navigate the pages. And as mentioned briefly before, there are three types of maps that we created. We created quality, opportunity, and threats. So on the next slide, I'll describe how we created these maps. Um, it's a little bit nitty gritty, but I'll do my best to explain this in, in, in short terms. Um, but we really focused on quality and opportunity, um, and we use zonation, which basically sums together individual spatial layers into a final ranked map uh, across the region. And we did this process for grassland, shrubland, woodland quality. And then we divided those further into spring and fall to account for seasonal abundance of uh, migratory birds. And we also did this to get our opportunity map. So then after doing this, we took the average score that overlapped with each and every site um, and then combined those for quality and opportunity to get our final ranked sites. Um, also note that we included layers for threats, but these were not part of our final score. And I'm gonna go on in further to each of these two um, and that, that'll probably make a little bit more sense as we move forward. So on to the next slide. Digging into a bit more detail, I'll start with quality. So we define this as protected areas that indicate high quality habitat for migratory stopover. Um, there's a lot here, but the main thing I really wanna highlight is the data we included in the process that's in that center part. Um, we used five major data sets, including the Great Lakes Joint Venture stopover scores for land birds, um, relative species abundance from eBird, of high priority um, from the Bird Conservation Network species list. And then Nature Conservancy data, Morton Arboretum's mapped oak, oak forest cores and land manager survey data, which included um, more things like dominant habitat, habitat heterogeneity and management. And an important thing to note here is we created individual scored maps for fall and spring for each habitat. Um, so next I'll show a brief tour of how to navigate the maps. So under quality, let's click on that. Um, you can see the maps are divided into woodland, grassland, and shrubland tabs. And to the top right in the layers, you can toggle them on and off like spring and fall. Um, and on the legend below will reflect what you're seeing. Um, and you can also search in the search bar for a specific site. 
And once you click it, um, you'll have auto-populated data, including things like seasonal scores, um, habitat information, um, large-scale metrics, and relative eBird abundance from 2021. And you can also click direct, uh, sorry, directly in the scroll bar on a site, or you can click within the map to auto-populate their data. All right, so on to the next slide. We'll talk about opportunity, which we defined as protected areas with significant opportunity for conservation and restoration efforts. And the process of creating this map was similar to quality maps. The main difference was that we did not need to subset by season or habitat type. Um, and the main data sources we used here are planning assistance to the state sites, priority areas for tree plantings from the Morton Arboretum, and a variety of information from land managers grouped into community involvement, management priority, and volunteer stewardship bins. And then if we go to the next slide, we can see um, the maps page. I didn't include a video because it really functions the same way. Um, the main difference is there's a slightly different output um, of information um, in that lower left-hand corner. Um, and then if we moved on, we can see the threats maps. So this is the last um, set of maps that we have. Um, these are threats to migratory birds. Um, we did not combine this with our final score um, since our focus was on quality and opportunity for ranking. Um, and threats really function as an important contextual reference um, to consider during management. However, we do include really actionable information as well, like invasive species. Um, in this data layers, you can look at things like light pollution, road density, transmission line collision risk, bird collision risk, and sites with a gap four status, um, which means that there are no known mandates, um, easements, or deed restrictions that prevent conversion of the natural habitat to anthropogenic. And then on to the next slide. Um, again, the threats map also functions really similarly to the quality map, um, aside from the fact that the different layers feature different threats, but not an overall score. And you can turn these layers on and off, also search for specific sites like the other tabs. And when you click on a site, um, you'll be able to see different site-based averages for different threats, um, as well as data like invasive species from our land manager survey. And then on to the next slide. We'll take a quick look at our priority species tabs and what they include. Um, these We have 21 species um, and they were chosen using a combina combination of bird conservation network's highest species of concern in the Chicago region and also climate risk from Audubon's survival by degrees data. And as you can see here, this is also like quality divided into woodlands, grasslands, and shrublands. Now on the next slide, um, like I mentioned before, we have 21 different uh, priority species grouped into the primary habitat type during migration. And we also include an overview of each species, helpful links, habitat needs during migration, and spring and fall abundance maps from eBirds 2021 abundance data set. And then if we hop on to the next slide, I'll introduce the priority sites page. Um, this includes eight different high priority protected areas along with management recommendations. And on the next slide, um, I mentioned here, the final priority sites were chosen through this combination of scoring as well as input from land managers. These scores were created by combining that average fall and spring quality score with opportunity um, sub subset by habitat type. Um, and this created top scoring sites for woodland, grassland, and shrubland habitats between a value of zero and two. Um, and then we evaluated the top sites from each habitat with land manager input, um, which sites would benefit most from management for migratory land birds. And so now I'll pass this on to Daniel to uh, discuss the recommendations themselves. Thank you, Jenny. So like Jenny was talking about the priority sites, um, we wanted to recommend a set of sites where restoration for migratory stopover habitat could really make a big difference. And we wanted to focus on sites that were uh, maybe underburdened or habitats contained within those sites that might need a little bit more attention and exposure in order to you know, create uh, diversity of habitats across the landscape. 
Um, so we honed in on eight uh, site complexes. Some are individual sites, some are strings of sites. For instance, a string of Chicago Park District sites along the north branch of the Chicago River that we kind of treated as a single site due to their proximity to one another. And you could see here, here's a, a, an example of the Calumet Marshes uh, priority site here. Uh, that contains data on quality and opportunity. So you can see those scores both uh, by habitat, but also across seasons. When you look at the quality score down there in the lower right, you can really get a sense for how the site may or may not uh, differ across seasons. In the case of Calumet Marshes, they're pretty useful across both seasons. Um, and so you can, oh, and also the, so the recommendations that you're seeing here um, are tailored to the individual sites themselves. Um, while we acknowledge that, you know, we have definite recommendations that we wanted to present to the land managers, we acknowledge that some sites may already be part of other planning efforts, may already have resources earmarked for doing restoration, and in which case we did not want to necessarily clash with uh, plans that may already be in the work. So we worked with the landowners uh, to really work on these uh, site overviews and the recommendations to make sure that they were grounded in, uh, in reality and to ensure that these were things that the landowners thought they could actually accomplish. Next slide. And so, um, Outside of those eight priority sites, uh, we wanted to provide valuable resources for local land managers. So as Stephanie and Jenny have both touched on, our project was really focused on the Illinois Coastal Zone, which is a narrow band that hugs the Chicago River and Lake Michigan, but thought that a lot of this information could also apply further inland to other landowner, park districts, municipalities, and we wanted to provide them with some good information as well. Um, and so, you know, across the region, we've got uh, lots of really experienced land managers. We've got big uh, governmental organizations, private organizations with lots of resources, and they all might already be doing a lot for migratory stopover habitat. But we also acknowledge that there are a lot of smaller landowners that might not have the resources and might not have the capacity or expertise to implement uh, changes for migratory stopover habitat. So we wanted to be sure that we, you know, gave them as much information uh, as we could. So we broke down our resources on three uh, different uh, scales. On the landscape scale, uh, where we're focusing just on the Illinois coastal zone, um, the local scale, which uh, delves into different types of uh, considerations for habitat management and bird uh, food preferences across seasons um, by habitat, looking at, again, grassland, woodland, and shrubland, where we've got maps with the distribution of each of those habitats and looking at the importance, threats, and restoration needs for each. Next slide. So on the landscape scale, um, you know, this this part of the tool really explains how we prioritized our focal sites uh, across the diversity of the Illinois coastal zone landscape. Um, and ultimately, we know that diverse habitats are so important. Uh, diverse habitats across the diversity of the of the region to account for individual species needs. Um, and again, looking at different scales, uh, we wanted to touch on uh, topics related to, to, to those different scales, especially like size and connectivity. We know those are huge influencing factors that you know can make or break your migratory stopover habitat. And acknowledging that we want to, we want to uh, know as much as we can about the individual niches that these species have. Some bird species are generalists, other birds are uh, specialists, and we wanted to make sure that we were including all of those considerations into our prioritization. Next slide. So with diverse habitats, again, you've, you've heard me say already a few times in the last couple of minutes how important it is to have a diversity of habitats to account for those individual species needs. Um, and, you know, habitats can range here. This is a nice uh, infographic that our um, design team at National Audubon helped us put together, looking at the three different habitats that we're focusing on, woodland, shrubland, grassland. 
We're not including uh, the actual uh, wetlands and open water habitats uh, along Lake Michigan because this project was really focused on land birds. Um, but we know, as you can see in this image here, um, while we're only talking about three different habitat types, woodland, shrub, and grassland, there's a lot of nuance and diversity within each of those. And so, uh, you know, from dense to bare ground in a grassland can really influence the type of birds that you will find. You know, some grassland birds like grasshopper sparrow really thrive off of uh, bare ground situations and other birds prefer more uh, coverage, complete coverage of wildflowers and grasses. In shrublands, we know the range uh, goes from some edge habitat to lots of edge habitat, which again can, can play a huge role in how many birds and what kind of birds show up within your shrublands. And in woodlands, we know there's a huge range in uh, canopy cover, ranging from open oak savanna to closed uh, canopy forests. Um, and so it's important to provide, you know, this, I think this uh, image really shows the importance to providing uh, all three of those habitats, but also hitting on um, on those those really specific considerations within each of those habitats. Next slide. And finally, on the local scale, here's where we wanted to really call out uh, some of the trade-offs in management decision making, which are complex and uh, you know, difficult to uh, to implement at times. Uh, so for instance, one major uh, consideration trade-off uh, scenario that many uh, land managers and stewards find themselves in is around invasive shrub removal. Um, you know, certainly there's a trade-off between, you know, there's two, there's two kind of phases, the way, the way that the current work is happening. One is, you know, removing all of the invasive woody material at a site in major chunks or in one fell swoop, and then going in and planting native shrubs to supplement that. We know that there are some issues there uh, with in terms of like building up that critical mass of shrubs to create those thickets that birds really need. Um, another approach that land managers can take is doing a phased uh you know, replacement of shrubs as you're removing non-native shrubs, you're introducing those native shrubs right off the bat so that you don't have a period of no shrubs available for migratory bird species. Because as we know, even um, non-native invasive shrubs can provide some cover, can provide some food sources, albeit not high quality food sources uh, for our birds. Um, and we also wanted to focus on food resources. Um, you know, different birds require different types of food at different times of the year. And on this page, we kind of break down some of the most important native plants for migratory birds. Next slide. And management uh, by habitat. So again, uh, looking at uh, woodland, grassland, and shrubland, uh, you can find here maps showing the extent of those habitats found within the Illinois coastal zone. Um, you know, we use a lot of different data sources, National Land Cover Database and CMAP for some of our uh, focal habitats. And again, uh, you might be wondering, you know, why there are some blank spaces on this map. Again, remember, we're only looking at public lands in this exercise, although perhaps in the future uh, we may be able to integrate, uh, you know, public or private lands or uh, lands outside of the Illinois coastal zone. Next slide. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie. All right, thanks, Daniel. So that is our demo of the tool so far. And now we're at the point where we're encouraging you all to go out and explore the tool, look around and test it out. And we um, encourage you also, if you're planning management in the near future, now is the time to do your planning and use the tool to determine where and what to where to work and what to focus on. Um, if you happen to manage uh, public lands in the Illinois coastal zone, and if you're not necessarily a manager but own um, property where you can um, put in native plantings. This tool may also provide um, ideas for native plants to track different birds and help out um, birds on their migration while they're visiting your yard. 
And if you're at the point where you just want to learn more about some of the species that are of high conservation concern and um, maybe migrating th through the Chicago area soon this spring, you can also check out our focal species and see where you can where you can find them or where you might be able to find them um, sometime while they're mo moving through soon. And what's next for the tool? So as Jenny mentioned, we do have a full literature review that is companion or backbone, as she said, um, to this research. And that's if you really want to read through all of the details, um, that'll be available in April. So we encourage you to take a look at that when that's available. And if we have any feedback or additional input from land managers coming in after the official launch of this tool, expect that to be um, included in an update to the tool this fall. And um, Ideally, we'd love to see a future expansion of this tool. As uh, stated numerous times, we were a bit limited in our geography, but we know that birds are using areas beyond the Illinois coastal zone in their um, stopover. So, I mean, we're, we're thinking it would be great to have something like this available at the scale of the Chicago wilderness region or even at the Great Lakes region um, because we see this as an important need um, across um, our larger region. So with that, we invite you to keep in touch and follow us along um, through our multiple social media outlets or check out our website. And if you have um, an interest in contacting us, you have our email here, Audubon Great Lakes at audubon.org. And I believe we have we have 30 minutes for questions. Not sure if we'll use that whole time, but again, just want to say a quick thank you to everybody for joining us today. And thank you to our land managers and the CW um, for hosting us as well as um, thank you again to our funders, Illinois DNR Coastal Program and NOAA. So I believe Daniel is going to be moderating our questions. So if you have any questions, please enter it into the chat um, or the Q&A feature if you're not able to um, use the chat. We also, um, you should be able to raise your hand and we can take questions that way too. Yep, thanks, Stephanie. And so please feel free to put questions into the Q&A, into the chat, raise your hand like Stephanie just said. We do have one question that has come up right now. Uh, this is from Lauren Umek, and I think we'll direct this question to Jenny. Can you explain more about the PAS, that's the Planning Assistance to States program from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers? Can you explain more about the PAS opportunity sites and how that information was included in the opportunity score with other factors? Uh, Lauren's understanding is that the only PAS in the region is along the river systems, but could be wrong on that. Yeah, that's a great question. So in terms of incorporating those sites, we did have several that were in the vicinity um, or overlapping with our sites. So we calculated the number of sites that were within that vicinity um, with a certain buffer um, to get kind of a score of how many um, are nearby. Um, as far as um, the opportunity sites themselves, I think Daniel might be able to speak better to, to the definition there. Um, but yeah, I, I hope that I hope that helps. Do you, do you know if they were just along the river, Jenny? Um, I don't recall specifically. I'd have to take a look at the map that the map itself, but a lot of them were on those river riparian areas. Yes. Thanks, and Lauren, if we feel like you didn't answer that question entirely, please uh, feel free to do follow up question as well. All right, the hotlines are open. Q&A, chat, raise your hand. I know everyone's eager to dig into the tool and they're probably uh, busy at the link poking through right now. Uh, but please let us know if you have any other questions. And uh, again, like we mentioned, we're happy to answer questions routed directly to the email that I shared before. And we can also drop that in the chat if you didn't get to catch that. But if there aren't any more questions, we just want to thank you all for 
joining us today and I hope you enjoy using the new tool. Let us know. Um, is it online now? Sorry, I just saw that come in. The answer is yes. <laughs> I, I If you um, want to share another link. If it hasn't been. Oh, okay. I see a couple more questions that just came in. So uh, one attendee is asking, is the tool online now or starting April 1st? Yeah, like I said, the tool is available now. Okay. And, and, we've got and Nicole just shared the link in the chat if you want to check it out. Excellent. There's just a couple of key pieces in the tool. Um, like I think Jenny mentioned that the literature review is being finalized. That will be up on the on the website, hopefully um, sometime in March or April. So stay tuned for that. That is loaded with all of the most up-to-date information from the literature on migratory stopover, on migratory stopover habitat creation, restoration, and everything in between. So stay tuned for that. We've got another question here uh, on, was any progress made on birds flying into buildings? Does anyone particularly want to tackle that one? Yeah, there, I mean, there definitely is progress happening continuously. I mean, this is a long journey that's been happening and being led by several of our partners um, uh, Chicago Bird Collision Monitor, Chicago Audubon Society, Chicago Ornithological Society, and the, the Bird Friendly uh, com Committee. And I can't necessarily speak to all of what is happening. It's a lot that's that's happening. Um, but uh, that, yeah, that hasn't necessarily been our team that's been the primary players on that. So I would, you know, just point you to the looking into the Chicago Bird Friendly Ordinance, Chicago Bird Collision Monitors to get uh, more information. And oh, I oh sorry, I'm not moderating the questions, but I do see the hand, there's a hand raised as well. Yep, I know Becky uh, has her hand raised. So um, oh, I see her in the Q and A. Yep, it's the questions there. Uh, and Becky, if you need to, uh, you can. He's unmuted mute. already. Yeah. But um, can you, remi uh, Becky's question is, can you remind us how the priority species were selected? Yeah, um, so that was uh, in combination with uh, species that were selected as uh, high conservation concern identified by um, the Bird Conservation Network, as which you know they use a lot of the the lists that exist um, of you know priority species that are already out there built um, by um, uh, organizations like the Joint Ventures and Partners in Flight. Um, so uh, that was one component, as well as Audubon's. Um, uh, climate uh, vulnerability that that also played a factor into which species were selected, and then we looked into breaking it down by habitat and um, what what species kind of ranked highest, uh, involving um, some of those different scores that already exist. Excellent. Thanks for that question, Becky. And uh, Chicago Bird Alliance just said that they can give an update on Bird Friendly Chicago. So if you would like to come off of mute and do that, please feel free. Oh, uh, yeah. Hi, this is Judy. Uh, so thank you for asking that question. But Oh, you just went on mute, Judy. Nice. Uh, okay. As, as Stephanie said, there are uh, three organizations that make up the uh, Bird Friendly Chicago. And then uh, there's now a larger group that uh, Open Lands is heading that includes a lot more uh, people. So there's a lot of action, you know, as you can imagine, since the McCormick Place debacle in October, um, a lot of groups have become more active. Unfortunately, the city, um, it, it is not moving the city. Uh, the, there's a um, new head of the Department of Planning Development. She's very pro development, and she's kind of got, uh, she's got her marching orders, which are to cut regulations. So, um, 
we've actually been really disappointed in that we thought we were going to get uh, all new buildings uh, that had to go through the planning and development process were, were going to have to um, be bird friendly. And, you know, just about, like within the past two months, the department told us no, that it's still going to be optional, just like it is now. Uh, it's just that they're going to have more points on the checklist. So we're super disappointed about that. Um, that has not been finalized. So April 15th is the date that they, were, they gave us that they will actually release uh, what their recommendations are to the public. So there's a lot that we can do right now. And the groups are getting together and planning to announce a big campaign, which you can watch out for. But you can go to the Chicago Bird Alliance webpage and you can see um, things that you can do right now. Uh, there's a, actually the, the city does have a link uh, where you can comment. And so you can go in and, and comment on that and We've had a ton of people use that link and we need a lot more because, you know, as I said, the city, uh, you know, we're, we're really up against the developers on this one. You know, they've, they've decided that they're going to sort of take a stand, um, which involves killing a lot of birds, sadly. So, um, yeah, so I encourage you to go to the Chicago Bird Alliance website and, um, you know, just look for, uh, look on the blog page, look for the updates on this. And the most recent one has the link that you can use and it has um, some suggested language. And uh, yeah, we really need that. One, one good, um, one piece of good news is that McCormick Place is, um, does have an RFP out for putting film on their windows. So we are hoping to see some progress there. And uh, we've heard that Fish and Wildlife uh, Enforcement Arm is is involved there, which is great. That would be the first time that they've ever gotten involved in this uh, window uh, collision issue. So uh, hopefully we'll see a lot more uh, of that. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Judy. And we just have one more question in here uh, that maybe Jenny can um, answer if you feel like you've got the a good handle on it. But Lauren, just just to follow up on the previous question, is wondering if maybe if the PAS sites are kind of confined to this riparian zone, do we think that it could have introduced some biases into uh, uh, towards city sites at the exclusion of Northern Cook or Lake County sites um, where the those uh, riparian corridors might not be as prevalent as in Chicago. I do think that that is a possibility. Um, and that's, that's a really great point. I think that's something that we can look into more. Um, I do remember too seeing that a lot of sites in the Southern region have a lot more a lot higher overall scores um, than northern sites, so that could definitely be a factor. Yeah. Yep, and it's just I think uh, also, especially in Lake County, where you've got such a small sliver of land that is actually in the Lake Michigan watershed, uh, makes it difficult and surprised me when I was looking at some of the sites and realizing, yep, oh, that one's outside of the watershed. That one's outside the watershed. So I think really underscores the our desire um, to expand this tool outside of just the Illinois coastal zone and start incorporating some of those other really critical uh, landscapes like the Desplaines uh, River watershed as well. So hopefully we can address that in the future. All right, I think that might be all of the questions. So Laura, I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to say on this slide, but Feel free. No, but I, I really appreciate everyone's time today and thank you for such a great presentation. Again, this will be recorded and a PDF of the slides will be uploaded to our website. And if you have a topic that you'd like to create a cafe on, please let me know. I'd be happy to work with you all on your own um, cafe in the future. But thank you so much. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you.